John Scott is the author of 16 books of poetry and prose. His works have been published in the USA and the UK and have appeared in French, German and Dutch translations. We are fortunate that he has agreed to do a rare public reading here at the Chamber of Poets. John Scott was born in England in 1948, but has since started to barrack for the uh, Australian cricket team. <laughs> Is that true? No. no. <laughs> it wasn't written down here, so I didn't think it was true. Uh, he's lived mainly in Melbourne, uh, formerly a freelance script writer for radio and television. He was also a professor in poetry and prose fiction at the University of Wollongong. He has been awarded three senior writers fellowships from the Literature Board of the Australia Council and has toured the United States and Canada reading his poetry. He's won uh, many prizes, including uh, some major ones, the Newcastle Poetry Prize, the CJ Dennis Prize for Poetry, Victorian Premier's Literary Award, and the Peter Porter Poetry Prize. Uh, a major experimental novel called N was published by Brandall and Schlesinger in April 2014. Is that your latest book? Yes, sir. Latest book. Uh, uh, John is currently working on a book-length poem. Uh, he, unfortunately, he has no books for sale because everybody's bought them. <laughs> so we can't buy any today, but please welcome John Scott. And his alter ego, John A. Scott. <laughs> oh, the trouble with this is you've got to wait all this time. You, know, you can't get it over quickly. Now you're going to put that where it's appropriate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How's this? Is that okay? Is that okay? Up a bit, maybe. Um, uh, Myron just mentioned the Peter Porter, Peter Porter Poetry Prize. They've got to do something about the name of it. Um, and um, this, um, I stopped writing poems for 20, 20, at least 20, 25 years, I think, and um, decided to write novels instead. Um, and then got so depressed with, um, with what was happening in fiction that I decided to go back and write poems because I thought it was a lot more interesting work being done in poetry than, than was actually being done uh, in Australian fiction, well, not only Australian fiction. So um, uh, I saw this Peter Porter Poetry Prize and, it, um, and in those days it was for a poem that was up to, up to 100 lines long. So I decided that I would write a poem that was exactly 100 lines long. And, um, and uh, the, poem, the poem came out of... Um, it, it's, 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 uh, the, first, the first lines were, were, um, were written about an uh, ex-girlfriend of mine who, um, who died. And, um, and I was just hunting through some papers and I thought, oh, well, here you go, I'll... Uh, I'll try and write this poem now. Um, but it didn't, as most, most poems do, they don't necessarily go the way you expect them to go. Um, and, and this one certainly didn't. Uh, so um, I thought I was, I was aiming for a sort of uncertain, worrisome type of tone. She couldn't quite work out where it was, where it was actually coming from. So it's called poem, <coughs> poem in 100 Lines. I should have started timing myself. Hang on. Um, so it's, um, one second, there we go, about quarter to four, quarter to four. It's called Poem in 100 Lines for the Peter Porter Poetry Prize. Uh, Betty is dying and it has fallen to me to make sense of it. You're the person who has words, John says. It's you who've won awards for your writing. He used to teach people how to write. I'm just an ordinary person. People, people like me can't speak about death. Only a poet can do something like that. I say, John, I've not written a poem for more than 20 years. Besides, these are really questions for God. No, he said, God would disagree. God would say that this is an earthly problem, one that only mortals can address, particularly poets. Poets. 
Once upon a time, I say, a task like this might have been possible before poetry was about poetry, became a game of words. Nowadays, I've no idea what constitutes a viable poem. I remember nothing of the poet's craft. Even when I was writing poetry, I knew nothing of the poet's craft. Just do the best you can, he says. I'll be in touch. During the week, John rings to say they found a growth at the top of Betty's lungs. The size of a fist, he says. And there's another in her throat about the same size. He says they'll be using various treatments, radiation, chemotherapy. I can't remember what else. John calls the next day. They're concentrating on her throat, he says. They start on Friday. Betty, he says, is optimistic. Her spirits are high. She's a fighter. Yes, I say. I lived with her for almost four years. He says that he'll call me when there's any change. After some time, he rings to tell me that after treatment, the fist in her throat has shrunk, only that in the business of shrinking, it has taken with it the flesh and whatever else there is that divides the air pipe from the food pipe. They're going to put something in her throat to fix the hole that the shrinking fist has caused. When next he rings, it's to tell me that Betty has started falling over. The room, the floor, both disappear, she says, and she falls. The time after is to tell me they have found lesions in her brain. Only in his distracted state, John says that they have found legions. Roman legions, foreign legions, ignorant armies that clash by night. He says things are not looking good. Elizabeth and I drive down to Melbourne. We meet with John at the hospital. Betty's propped up in a bed in a private room. She can no longer speak. She could nod. We take turns to tell her about what we've been doing, which is nothing much. She nods. After half an hour or so, a woman enters the room. She says Betty will soon be moved to a much nicer facility. She can have a pet with her, for instance, and there will be guest rooms where family and friends can stay overnight should they wish. She hands out a brochure. Eventually, it's time to go. We say goodbye. One by one, we hold her propped body in our arms the best we can. While walking back to the car park, it becomes clear John does not know the meaning of palliative. He is saying, how much nicer, how much nicer the palliative hospital sounds, we tell him what it means. A fortnight later, when we're back home, John calls again. Betty's dead, he said. He's sorry he hasn't rung before. He talks about the last nights at the hospital, how he'd gone out to buy a bottle of whiskey for Betty so they could get drunk together, like old times. It was John who first introduced us. Betty was the ex-wife of John's brother. We liked each other right from the start. Before too long, we moved in together. Every now and then we spend evenings just getting drunk. She'd drink whiskey, straight, no ice. I'd drink whiskey and coke. Three years later, she left me for a young farmer from Camden. After a month, she left the farmer and came back. We lived together again for one more year, then she asked me to leave. Do you love me? I asked her one night. No, she said. In fact, it would be better if you left tomorrow. This was when I wrote poetry. If she died around this time, I could have penned something worthwhile for her instead of this. Three days after the funeral, John rings. He says he needs to tell something about his last months with Betty. He's kept daily notes. Two hours in, near the end, he says, he'll stay a while with Betty's father in Queensland. They can both grieve together, he says. No matter how hard I try, I can't write the poem that explains everything. But as months go by, it happens that John loses the need to have one and stops asking about it. Then one day, while catching up, he mentions a poetry prize. Peter Porter, he said, do you know his poems? The cost of seriousness will be death, I quote. That may be so, he replies, but what happened with Betty's poem? I say, I never finished it. <laughs>
He says, maybe you should finish it for the prize. Just think what you could do with $4,000. So it is I construct a hundred line poem on the inability to write a poem. I give each line 12 syllables to demonstrate the poet's craft. The entrance fee goes on visa. I count the lines once more, slowly, to be certain. Ah. <sighs>